So again, uh, this, uh, the, the, the goal of this meetup is more to look at the setup, schemas, importing uh, data, and working with GraphQL within Weave 8. Uh, again, there are other meetups planned as well, more deep dives, more about horizontal scalability, those kind of things. The goal of this one is more generic. So we're going to look at installation and setup, so how you can work with the Weave 8. I'm going to run an installation. Um, I'm going to show you how you can configure an installation. We're going to talk about schema because uh, something that is important uh, within Weave 8 is the, uh, uh, is the schema. Weave 8 works with a schema. Um, we're going to look at importing data. We're going to look at the clients that you can use to actually interact with the APIs coming out of Weave 8. And last but not least, we're going to look a little bit at the GraphQL interface. Um, the GraphQL interface is often used to you know, show Weave 8's capabilities. Um, in this situation, I'm going to look more at GraphQL from the perspective of when we create a scheme and if we work with a, with a schema. So you might have seen this drawing more often, or this, this visual. And uh, what we try to show with this visual is that um, uh, Weave 8 is not only a tool to work with um, and scale your machine learning models, it's actually a database on its own. So what you see in the center, and something that you will also see when we go over the installation, is that you can also choose to run Weave 8 standalone. We see also some community members do that because, for example, they have their own vectors or they have very specific models that they want to work with. And then the power sits in the fact that you can store both the data object, as you can see here with my mouse, and the vector representation of um, the data object, how you're representing it. And you can choose to or have VV8 vectorized data for you. So as you can see here, we have text vectorization, we have image vectorization. We currently have also some community members working on audio. We know people working on video, but what we now have out of the box is text vectorization and image vectorization. Or you have these other modules, for example, to conduct semantic search or question answering and those kind of things. So it's very important to bear in mind. So you can you can use Weave 8, uh, run Weave 8 standalone, but then you have to provide your own vectors to represent your data, or you can use one of these modules to represent the data. Something we will go also go over. Um, important to bear in mind the the schema that we will be looking at Weave 8 as a class property uh, schema. Important also to bear in mind that sometimes people refer to Weave 8 as a graph database, which it is not. Uh, Weave 8 is a vector database. The focus is on vector search, but we've decided to adopt the um, uh, the graph data model uh, that we get from uh, GraphQL to represent the data. So regardless if you think of VF8 as a, um, a, a NoSQL database where you have data objects representing the data, or maybe even if you look think a little bit more in, in, in a SQL-like structure where every, I don't know, every row or something has a, has a vector representation, we have chosen this representation. And the easiest way to think about that is that every data object, so what you see here in the yellowish uh, um, uh, uh, circle uh, with a clause and a property, gets a vector representation that you can place that in the vector space. Well, this is a very simplistic one because this is an XY, and as you will see later, these machine learning models output more complex vectors or more hyperspace vectors, however you want to call them. So, but that's basically the concept. So that's what makes um, Weave as a database different. So it's not uh, focusing necessarily pure on the NoSQL part, not purely focusing on, on the graph part, it's really focusing on working with these, uh, with these vectors. So let's dive right in from the perspective of the, uh, of the documentation. So if you go to Weave8's documentation, this is the page where you start. And the first thing that you want to look at is the, is the installation. And one of the things that we created to install Weave8 is the, uh, the customize your Weave8 setup. Way more information. If you want to go more into Kubernetes or the cloud service or what have you, you can look at those as well. But a nice way to get started is to look at the, uh, the customizer. And the customizer is just a menu where you can exactly walk through to con basically configure this image. So we start from the perspective of the center. So what Weave 8 version do you want to use? Well, uh, needless to say that it always starts with the, yeah, with the, with the, with the latest version. So here we selected our Weave 8 version. Then you select the media type. So the media type is referring to here what you see with the text vectorization or the image vectorization. So actually, if I huh, click the drop down menu, we can see text, images, text, and images, or none. 
if I select none, I'm basically saying I only want to use this center piece. So this is the piece that people are using if they just want to store their data objects and have their own vector representations. Um, we're not going to do that. So we're going to say like we're going to go for a for a text uh, media type. Then it automatically asks which one do you want to use. So we have two modules. Here you see text modules. And those are in line with the modules you see in the left hand side, the text to fact modules. So we have uh, uh, the contextionary that is based on uh, GLOV and uh, and or fast text and is only util utilizing CPU. So this one is often used for, for example, classification tasks or where speed is of the essence or where GPUs are unavailable or we have the transformers. Um, so let's choose the transformers. We have a few pre-packaged transformer modules, as you can see here. So the, the most used for semantic search. However, if you have your own uh, transformer model, you can use it as well. So um, what you can do is that you can, if you go into the, so let's go in here. So if you go into the menu item of the text-to-fact transformers, you can even uh, uh, load a uh, publicly available hugging face model into uh, um, uh, into one of these modules as well. But for now, we're going to go with the prepackaged modules, which means as much as, as you will see in a bit, that the containers are just, we prepared the containers for you, so you don't have to do anything. Um, then we have, for example, the Q&A uh, module, as you can see here as well. So this is representing this module. I'm going to disable that for now. We have named entity recognition, going to disable it as well. Spell check module, going to keep the disa uh, disabled as well. GPU support. So if you're running a machine that uh, supports GPU, you can just simply enable it. Um, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to run it locally and I don't have a, a, a GPU uh, available on this, uh, on this laptop. Um, important to mention for these modules is that even if you want to, um, you, you can, oh, let me accept somebody. So what you can do is you can use these basic modules, but what you can even do is that you can create custom modules. And we will dive a little bit further in what that exactly means. But the last meetup from two weeks ago that my colleague uh, Laura presented, she really dives into these custom modules, but I'll say a few words about that in a bit as well. And uh, so we're going to keep the GPU support disabled. Then we have, this is um, uh, not for community users, this is for enterprise users. So I'm gonna use, disable this as well. And then you can use select your desired runtime. And I'm running it on my local machine. So I'm gonna go for Docker Compose. And what you see that happens is just, it outputs a curl command that downloads the Docker Compose file. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna select this Docker Compose file just to look at it so that we can quickly look at what's actually happening. So what you see here, is that Weaviate is built. So if we go back to this image again, uh, everything is packaged in separate containers. So the more modules you select, that's perfectly fine, but the more containers you will be running. So here you see, of course, the, 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 the core container, if you will, that is Weaviate itself. There are some configuration attached to it, uh, which of course in the documentation, you can find more about that as well. But here, for example, you see that we've chosen the text to fact transformers module, the image that we prepackaged that's related to that, and we set a CUDA for GPU to zero. And here you see that the inference API has actually here the transformers, uh, uh, text to fact transformers at port 8080, which refers to this one. So if I now would go back, and if I would say, well, I'm going to, let's go into a previous step, and let's say, that I'm going to, uh, well, let's enable the spell check module. If I now go further and I look at another Docker Compose file, so I'm gonna select this as well, then you see that in the configurator that's automatically added, right? So you now see your text spell check, the image that's related to that. And then you see that besides the transform inference API, um, uh, there's also the spell check inference API. So the more modules you add, the more that it automatically adds here. Um, and here you see actually the modules that there are enabled. There's not really a restriction to it. What you even can do, which is not available to the configurator because it would be a very uh, obscure setup, but you could even choose to have multiple inference APIs for uh, text to fact modules. 
Why that is, is something that we will look at at the um, uh, when we look at creating the schema. But what I did, I already downloaded one of these uh, files. So if I now uh, look at this file, here we go. So here you see I've created one. Uh, I've downloaded a file which has a text effect transformer. Uh, uh, CUDA is disabled. Um, uh, and of course, we have it itself. So if you now currently look at my Docker setup, which is nothing is running, as you can see, I can do simply do Docker Compose up, and it will take these um, this configuration. So sometimes people say like, hey, these, these transformers uh, containers are big. They are, they are over a gigabyte because they contain the actual modules. Now, maybe also nice to look at what's happening here because we sometimes get questions about that as well, is that the, the messages that um, uh, uh, we've had outputs are as descriptive as possible. So um, uh, here you see, for example, that we've had this started but that it's waiting, in this case, for the uh, transformer module to start up, which takes some time to boot. And then in that container, you see that it's running. It's running on CPU. At some point, it's just like, OK, I'm, I'm ready. And then you see that we've hit just like, OK, um, uh, here it says, like, I could not rebuild the GraphQL schema, which is correct, because it's an empty we've hit. And then it says, like, OK, I'm ready. I'm serving with it at port 8080 at localhost, which you can simply check by going there. So let's go to localhost. And then you see this is with it. Also here to the API, we try to be as descriptive as possible to describe what's, um, uh, uh, what's happening. So for example, hey, you can look at the meta endpoint to get some basic information, uh, but also at the schema endpoint. Which brings me to the next step in WeaveJet, because uh, as we see from the menu, that if you now have a WeaveJet running, the most important thing is that you want to create, well, I say schemas, but I should say schema, that you want to create a schema. And uh, the schema has the class property structure. Oh, apologies, the class property structure that you want to that you want to represent. And there's a bunch of data types available for properties, which we will go over as well. But if you go to the RESTful API, Endpoint, you look at the, at the schema. You can, for example, look at create a class, and it's explained exactly what's available, what options, the properties are available. There's a simple request available in any um, uh, um, language that you like, or there's a complete example available. We are going to look at the curl example. And the reason that I'm doing that is because um, I want to give you a demo that is um, uh, programming language agnostic. So this is just purely speaking to the uh, to the API. Important to know is that although some of the client libraries have specific functionality in them, for example, to regulate batching and those kind of things, um, uh, in general, everything is happening through the API. So the um, the client libraries are just ways to access the um, uh, the RESTful API. Now I prepared something here as well. So. If you want to write something to the schema, as you can see here from the um, uh, uh, from we need to post something to v1 slash schema. And the, the first thing that we might want to do is that we want to create a class. So let's look at that. So we want to create a class. And the class, a class name can be anything, any noun, or any verb. We are about to release uh, um, a less strict way of defining classes. But for cur currently, for now, these are uh, words. And the reason that we use words is because sometimes, as you will see in a bit, uh, people um, uh, want to use the class names or the property names in the vectorization um, uh, process. So let's um, uh, take for this example, let's use the word um, document. Important to know, every a class can have any, um, uh, uh, you can use any word, so any noun, um, that you can think of to describe it. And if you can even change um, chain them, uh, 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 for example, if you would say like document about cars, this would be a, oh, without the typo, this would be a valid class name. Uh, what VV8 would do, if you decide to factorize the class name, it would just use, split these words like this and say, okay, I'm gonna use the word document about and cars to uh, um, uh, factorize content. Next, we want we need to give a description. So let's say 
example class. And then in the, the, the list of information that we need to provide are the other are properties. So the properties is an array because as you could see here in this example, a class can have one or more properties attached to it. If you don't set any, you need to set a property because if you don't set any property, if there's no metadata available to the, uh, to the class. One thing that you always get automatically and that you don't have to set in WeFit is a unique identifier. WeFit will always assign an ID or you can assign your own ID. These properties are written with a lowercase. We kind of adopted that from uh, an RDF kind of way of writing. So a class starts with a capital and um, uh, a property starts with a, with a, uh, a lowercase. So we can say name and then we can say, for example, title. So for example, the document has a uh, title. Now, what we also need to do, what you can see from the scheme, where we need to provide it a, a data type, which I will copy here, that's easier. The data types that we have available are, uh, let me have a quick look here. So these are all the data types that we have available. So strings, string arrays, integers, integer arrays, et cetera. Um, we also have a, a, a blob data types. And what is important to bear in mind, that is the vectorizer that you have chosen needs that information. So for example, a text vectorizer needs a string or a, uh, a text data type uh, to, to vectorize something. But if you, for example, would have chosen an image vectorizer, you need the blob data type because you the image that you will provide with it with will be used to create that vector uh, representation. So let's keep that to string. And then we need to always give it a description. So let's also just say here, test uh, property. Now, what is in, this is the least amount of information that you need to give with it. Um, it will take all the default uh, uh, settings to, to, to create these, um, uh, the class in this case. However, it is interesting to take a, a look at a few specific things that we can set. And most importantly, when it comes to indexing, it has to do with the module configuration. So the module configuration you can set, and it's best to look at that here from the uh, example, we can be very specific, for example, about the vectorizers that we want to choose. So let's say that we have a case where we have a text objects and image objects. We can actually tell we I want you to vectorize one class, for example, with the uh, with a text to vec uh, vectorizer or with an image to vec vectorizer. And here, this is what I meant with vectorize class name. You can set that to true or to false. So let's just take this information and just put it in. So this is what it would look like. And what we've now what we've now done is that we've extended. Oh, here we go. We've extended the configuration a little bit because it now says vectorize class name is to true, and I'm going to set that to false. What that means is that if I would have a document and I would have a title, and the title would be, for example, um, uh, the, the title of, I don't know, an article, what you would get is the following. So you would get a the class document, there is the property title, and then the title is like, let's call it foobar. What WeVit does is that if I would set this to true, what WeVit would do is that it would actually take literally the word document to create a vector representation of uh, um, uh, uh, that class name. So if I now set this to false, it will not take the document anymore. So it will only now take the property name and the um, and the content that we will add later in the as a data in the data object. So I can do the same thing here as well. So, and this, by the way, needs to be a uh, transformer because it's like we're not using a the context scenario with a transformer. And we can do the equivalent for the, uh, here for the properties. So I'm gonna copy that as well. So here I'm saying, let's also put this to false. Also transformer. Oh. And what this would do is that it would say, well, we're only gonna take the information, the data that we're going to store in here to create a vector representation. Depends on your use case what you want, but we see in practice that actually often these are set to, uh, sorry, these vectorized class name and vectorized property name are set to false. 
what does skip mean skip says like do you want this to be part of the um of the factorization process so let's say for example that i create a second property i just copy this and i'm and i'm gonna call that um, um subtitle there might be a situation where i that i want to have these uh, this information in there but i did that i want to skip the um, uh, um, the factorization of the subtitle, and I don't want to um, factorize in this case the word subtitle. So now it will only take the data that we're giving as a title to factorize. Uh, let's see if this, so this, by the way, this needs to be lowercase. I, I was like, why is it red? But here we go. So this, for example, would create a data object that says like, um, I'm going to create a, um, uh, uh, a class, which is a document. That's the description example class. The module configuration says like, it's focusing on transformers. That's the module that we selected that we're running right now. We do not want to factorize the class name. We have a property that is title, and we have another property that is subtitle. They both take strings as data types, and here we're gonna skip the indexing, and we're gonna not um, factorize the property name. Um, let me quickly double check that I said that correctly. I think it is transformers, girl. Let me also see if this is correct. There you go. So I think this should be correct. So if I now gonna, I don't know why this has a uh, red underline, but basically I'm going to post as the JSON to uh, the endpoint local host and then schema. So here we go. Let's see if I made a mistake there. And I didn't. So what we now can do is that if you go back to Weaviate, so you see, this is the previous one. We had schema, which has no classes, but if I now refresh it, you see here we have our document, right? And it, you see it also set some basic um, uh, or default uh, um, uh, configuration, but here we set, for example, factorize class name to false, et cetera. Uh, let's see if I, oh, this should have been transformers. Okay, so here you see how it, set that information and now what's important that if i now take this information and i go to the to the console if you go to console.semi.technology uh, so i'm now going to quickly jump to the uh, graphql interface i'll go back to the schema but just to show you something what you can do is you can always connect to a VFA that's running on your um, uh, local host so uh, that's just running that's just running on your local machine or wherever you connect it to it will never send any data to the cloud is just um, um, uh, it's just a front end that you can access the GraphQL interface easily. So if I now connect it and I go to the query module, so what you can see is uh, that we've created the class document. So if I now go in there and I say get, oh, let me increase a little bit, you will see that the first class that I now can access is document, the one that we just created, which has title and which has subtitle. And if I now run this query, you'll see that it's empty because we haven't added any data. Now, one more thing that I want to show to you re uh, related to the um, uh, to the schema is that if we now create a new um, class, so we have here document, and let's say that we have a paragraph, for example. Example uh, paragraph. So we can say, uh, let's say that we take also Let's say that we have content. Let's say that is of the data type text. So now we say like we have content that is text. We're gonna uh, not skip it. So skip is false. We're gonna not factorize the uh, property name. And we're gonna say test property for paragraph. But what we now can also do is that we can make a reference to document. So how that's often used is that we say in document, for example. The data type is going to be document because we just have we have document, so we can say like the data type is document. Um, we're gonna uh, not factorize anything related that, to that, and test property for document 
CREF. Now, if I'm now gonna run this query, I just send that to the RESTful API. Here we go. If I now refresh my um, my current module, look what I can do now. I can do I can do again. Now, paragraph is also available, and I can say, well, there was a there's content of the paragraph, and in document. So this is, and then we have the data object of the document, and we can also see that if we refresh here the schema, now you see the document here, but you also see the paragraph here. So this is in the most, oh, sorry, this is in the most basic form a way to create the schema and how you can um, uh, query through it. Um, that brings me to the um, uh, importing data and the clients. So what we see uh, is that uh, a lot of people use the, where's my documentation? Yeah. So a lot, of, almost nobody uses the, the curl uh, uh, um, endpoint. I'm just using that to be programming um, language agnostic. So people choose one of these um, uh, uh, client libraries to, to import data. We see that a lot of people use the, uh, uh, the Python client. So what you can see is that if you add data, which we call objects, you can actually see, so let me go down here. So you, oh, uh, where is it? Create a data object. So we have, we say like we post to the objects endpoint. So here you see, for example, an example of a data object. And then we see here, we see the curl equivalent, and this is the Python equivalent. What we do not have inside Weave 8, but outside Weave 8 is, for example, uh, ways to automate batching. So Weave 8 does have a RESTful batching endpoint so that you can add multiple uh, data objects at the same time. But for example, one of the nice things that's in the Python client is that you can say, uh, oh no, sorry, that's actually here, apologies. So that you can say batch data and then here in Python, for example, you see there are all kinds of methods that you can use, method one, method two, et cetera, to automatically um, uh, uh, create these batch sizes. This is a very nice feature. This was uh, actually suggested by one of the community members where it automatically determines uh, based on the setup of your Weave 8, how many um, uh, uh, objects can be can be processed. So it automatically scales and, and, and in size and it decreases in size when, uh, the machine needs some more time to process data, for example. Now, let me go back to objects. So let me create one data object. So uh, let's do that from the perspective of curl as well. So let me just copy this. So what we here do is actually to add something is that we really follow the, um, the structure that we have in our schema. So let's say for the sake of argument that we're gonna work with the document. So we know we have the class document. You can choose to specify your own unique identifier of have Weave do it. So I'm gonna just go for, uh, uh, I just wanna have Weave do it. I'm gonna set my title. Oh, title. And then this is the title of the demo object. And I believe we also had sub title this is the sub title oh, a little sub title so here we see that in line with where we here have document and the property title and subtitle i can actually define them right here when i add these data objects so let's go back to the graphql overview if i now run document and I say title, subtitle, there's no data in there, right? So it's empty. So what I now can do is that I can take this information, paste it in. Maybe it's a little bit nicer if I pipe that to JQ. Now, and what you see that's happening right now is that it had added the data object. You already see the vector representation that it gave the data object. And then you see like it created the class, it returned it a, a 200 code. It defined a unique identifier and here you see the um, uh, the information that, that I that I added. So if I now rerun this query, you see here is our document. And the thing is, because we told Weave8 that we wanna not only use the database, but also the text factorization part. If I now say, show me the um, 
sorry, additional, show me the factory presentation. Then it shows both the factory presentation, as you can see, as well as the, uh, uh, the data itself. Where did it get that factor uh, from? Well, it got that factor from the transformer module that we selected. I'm going to take one more step. So I'm going to step now into our demo data set because otherwise I'll I need to keep adding, <laughs> manually keep adding um, uh, uh, data objects. So if I now go back to our documentation, what is handy to know that is if you go to the uh, GraphQL interface examples, you see these green bulbs here where every example query is something that you can uh, try out real time. So here you see, for example, this data set has articles and publications. So I give this example quite often, so I'm just gonna keep it short. But here you see like we have publication, we have a name, we have multiple data objects here. All these data objects have these vector representations that they've gotten from the transformers module. So now what I can do is something like this, Ooh, is something like this. So I can say near text, let me, yeah, concepts, and then for example, magazine about fashion, limit that to the first result. And now it will vectorize based on the text to vec vectorize the query. And it will match that against all the vectors that we have for in this case, the publications. So if I run that query, you see it returns Vogue. And we can even say for Vogue that that has a vector representation as well. So this is the vector representation in this case, representing, scroll down all the way, Vogue. So that is how um, uh, the schema um, uh, uh, is used within Weaviate to add data. So important as a quick recap. So we have chosen in this setup to only work with the text factorization and of course the Weaviate database itself. You can choose multiple modules if you like. And these modules, what they do is that they add here in for every class, they add functionality. So to give you a practical example in this data set, this data set has a uh, text factorizer, um, but it also has, for example, the question answering module enabled. And so what the question answering um, oh, module does is, so let's say I can say title, I can say summary. So this data set contains a few thousand articles. So if I say ask, ask is enabled by setting the question answering module. I can say question and then I can say, oh, is the CL? Oh, Coca. I can tell Weaviate to find the answer in the summary, limit it to the first result. Uh, bear in mind, ask only becomes available if you in the configuration, if you've enabled the question answering module, you don't have to, it's only if you need it. And then also this additional feature becomes available, which is of course answer and then result and certainty. So this is an example of using that Q&A module over this data set. So if I now run this query, you see that it retains the answer based on all these articles. So that's how you, based on your use case, can decide what kind of modules you like. And sometimes we even see people that create their own modules. Again, if you wanna create your own module, Look at the previous meetup video by my colleague Laura, where she explains in detail how that works, how you can create your own modules, uh, et cetera. Let's see if there's more. Nope, that is basically, I'm, ooh, I'm talking for 35 minutes already. That's basically what I wanted to share. So I'm very curious to hear if, that, if you have any questions based on this presentation. Thanks for listening, by the way. <laughs> Uh, I have a question. <clears throat> I have uh, uh, a data set which uh, it contains. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a JSON, uh, and some of the uh, the classes that I have, they have subclasses uh, of it. So, if I want to make uh, properties out of it, how do how do I uh, get childs in my uh, in my schema? Yeah. So the the best way to do that is with work with these with these cross reference cross references. So let me quickly share my screen again. And you can make as many cross references as you like. So I'm going back to this um, demo data set with these articles. So let me write a very simple query. 
nothing fancy happening here. So, and this query says as much as like, okay, show me the first article that you have in the, da the data set, right? So here we just have a, an article that had a title. But as you said, you have subclasses. Now, this, an article actually also has a subclass because it's in a publication. So what we can say now is like in publication, on publication, and then the name. And what you will see if I run this query, you see that this is, this is an article that was published on Fox News. Uh, and as you can see, it is an, a nested data object. And you can even um, uh, go as far as keep these nets going. So you can have like a nested uh, um, uh, cross-reference in your data object, which can have another a nested data object, et cetera. So for example, I think here we have, for example, has articles. So then I can even go as far as has article, oh, has, uh, no, sorry, not in, on article, apologies. And it says title, so this is not a nice circular thing. So we go from articles, we take the first article the title, we look at the publication that it has, which has a name, which we know is Fox, and which has articles again. So then we can say, okay, show me then that, those articles. So if in our net, hey, you see how that's nested. So we have the title, which is the in publication, folks, which has articles again. And now if I open that, you see the articles that are in here. And one more way to show this is that, for example, if you now look at it from that perspective, not from the articles, but from the publications, you could say, for example, publication, name. Now let me also say like that, uh, limit one. So you say, and that's again, that's Fox. So now I can also see here it has articles. Home article and title. So that is how you can how you can chain them together. What's also nice to know is that you can even use these um, uh, vector searches within them. So, for example, the publication example that I showed with uh, uh, folk, for example, if and I say okay concepts and then magazine oh, about fashion and then I say limit the. Uh, limit that to the first result. So what you will see here that, let me close this. So it shows folk, and then it shows actually the articles that are in folk. So here you see all kinds of fashion related articles. So hopefully that answers the question. Any other um, question that I can answer? Silence on the call. <laughs> we go uh, unmute myself here. So yeah. you were saying that Laura two weeks ago gave a custom modules meetup, and in the future you're you're going to talk about horizontal scaling. Is that kind of the access to information? Uh, sorry, one more time. The last part of the of the of the question. So uh, you mentioned uh, Laura had done the, the custom modules before. That's already available. But the yeah. hor you had also talked about horizontal scaling. And, and, yes. and is that in the future that, that doesn't exist right now in somewhere that, is, that I could go look at? Oh, yeah, you can actually. So let me share my screen again. So the... Um, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, in the docu uh, documentation, so if you go to uh, custom modules, you can actually see there's a video. So that's from two weeks ago, where Laura is presenting how you can create custom modules. The, uh, if you look at the architecture and the roadmap, there's a video from my colleague uh, HN talking about the, the deep dive and the complete roadmap. Two weeks from now, there will also be a meetup that's only about um, uh, horizontal scalability. And I believe that even the first uh, release candidate will be presented in two weeks for, for a horizontal scalability. So we aim to have horizontal scalability available in, in just a few weeks from now. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Any other questions that I can answer? In that case, if there are no other questions, then um, the last thing for me to say is like, thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you for listening. 
Um, you can come on our Slack channel if you like. So there's like a lot of people on the Slack channel where you can ask questions, where you can interact with the, with the team. You of course also have the uh, um, uh, the documentation that I sh just showed you. Everything is available uh, through the website. Everything is part of the open source package. So um, we're looking very much forward to hear the uh, the things that you're building with Reviate. And again, uh, well, thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, for listening and have a nice rest of the day or nice evening, depending on where you are in the world. But uh, thank you so much. See you next time, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.